15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello, and thank you for joining us on episode 171 of the Space Nuts podcast. My name is Andrew Dunkley, and joining me, as always, astronomer at large, Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hey, fancy seeing you here, Andrew. It seems, you know, only a day or two (laughs) since we spoke. (laughs) Funny how time just is so It melts away. It It melts away, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Never mind. That's all right. Mm. Now... Uh, Let us uh, go through the agenda for today, shall we? Uh, We've um, come across a watery new exoplanet, which sounds rather exciting because we've been looking for one of those. (laughs) Because, uh, you know, um, uh, we we have a planet that's in the Goldilocks zone where liquid water exists and thus life. And so the, the school of thought is if we can find another one, maybe that's got life too. Hmm. They've found one, but it doesn't sound like a very nice place. We'll just put it at that point. Uh, we've also um, got a story about a, um, a, a massive explosion that seems to have occurred at some time in our galaxy's history. This is a, 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 an explosion that's resulted in sort of two radio bubbles that have been discovered at our central core. Um, and uh, what caused it is the subject of much um, or deliberation and uh, and. and Uh, speculation, but um, maybe it's got something to do with the black hole, maybe not. And we're going to answer a few questions. Uh, Somebody's uh, piped one in about uh, the Juno mission and asked if future probes to Jupiter might use Jupiter's radiation as a source of power rather than relying on uh, solar panels to get um, energy from a distant sun? That is a great question. And we're going to tackle... It's it's sort of a question. It's it's something that someone experienced some years ago, uh, Lloyd Galbraith, from Cairns in North Queensland uh, nearly broke his toe on a rock some years ago and now he thinks it was a special rock. He drew a happy face on it and everything, I reckon. Uh, so we'll find out what that rock might be. And uh, a simple question, and, and I must say that the um, the author of this question was a little embarrassed, Fred, but it is actually a brilliant question to to sort of get us back to basics about the universe. Why does everything spin? So we'll tackle all of those uh, in this episode of Space Nuts. But let's start off with this uh, incredible find. Uh, They're already labelling it Earth 2, a watery planet, uh, an exoplanet that that seems to be in the right place uh, in orbit of its star. Yes, that's right. Uh, The... The uh, this planet, which rejoices in the delightful name of K two eighteen B, and the two tells you it's from what was called the K two mission, which um, was the Kepler spacecraft uh, engaging in a f- further searches of stars once its gyroscopes had given up, uh, so it could only point in certain directions. Um, so this. Uh, this story is about the discovery of a planet which is about 110 light years away, uh, so kind of not really on our doorstep, uh, but uh, nevertheless of great interest. And what's what's been discovered? First of all, the discovery of the planet itself, which I think was about four years ago uh, with the Kepler-2 mission. Um, and that t- t- tells you that... Uh, the, the 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 planet is about twice the diameter of the Earth because you can detect that when a planet passes in front of its parent star. If you know how big the parent star is, and we we do know generically about the diameters of stars uh, of different types, you know how big the parent star is. You know how much its light dims when a planet wanders in front of it, and by combining those two, you can work out the diameter of the planet, which is, as I said, it's about eight times, um, so, sorry, about twice the diameter of the Earth, which, uh, and it turns out um, from other measurements that it's got about eight times the mass of the Earth, and those two figures suggest that it's probably rocky. Okay. Uh, that's the, uh, you know, the outcome of that, rather than being a gas giant. But that's an interesting anomaly. It's twice... The diameter of Earth and eight times the mass is that yeah is that normal yeah because if it's the same material of the Earth uh, two cubed is eight um, and it's so the you're cube getting into a realm that really troubled me at school so <laughs> okay it's quite all right <laughs> things like that 
troubled me too. <laughs> um, so it's bigger than the Earth, and that, of course, means it's got a, a higher level of gravity than the Earth has. It would not be a pleasant place to walk so on. So you'd probably be much heavier. You would indeed. You'd be, your weight would be much greater. Uh, but the the reason why this is an exciting finding and why it's you know getting quite a bit of media attention is that the, 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 there have been follow-up observations made with the Hubble Space Telescope uh, looking at the way the atmosphere of this planet um, impacts the light of the star when the planet passes in front of the star. So this is a trick we've talked about before. Uh, you, you look for the change in the spectrum of the star when the planet is in front of it, because um, what the atmosphere of the planet does is puts its own fingerprint on the on the rainbow colours of the spectrum of the star, and the, 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 that you know well-known barcode of information that you get is modified by the atmosphere of the planet, and that's how the scientists know that there's water vapour there. It's um, I actually read the Nature paper because I was asked to comment a couple of times on this. Uh, Nature being the journal in which this um, re research has been published, mm. and the uh, the modelling that they've had to do to. Uh, make this discovery is quite significant, uh, but certainly the, the the graphs and the data which I saw, um, they do support the conclusion that these authors come to that there is water vapor in the atmosphere of the star. Now that's uh, sorry, the people atmosphere of the planet. Quite excited because now they're thinking, all right, water vapor in the atmosphere, maybe lakes and rivers, yeah. maybe oceans. Yes, that's right. Maybe a temperate world. Um, uh, th th there are some. I think the. Temperature range, uh, it, I think the, the lowest part of it is a bit um, debatable, but the, the uh, so by, sorry, by that I mean the lower limit of the temperature range, um, possibly zero, possibly below zero Celsius, uh, with a probable maximum of about 46 degrees Celsius. Gee, that's so sounding very much like where I live. <laughs> Actually, now I've just remembered something I read in the in when I read the paper itself, which um, I think it put the lower end of the range as 200 uh, degrees Kelvin. Now, 200 degrees Kelvin is minus 73 degrees Celsius, oh, so could be it could be well below zero. But that makes it similar to Mars. Mars is you know, that kind of temperature. Yeah. And we know there's liquid water on Mars underneath its south pole and probably um, occasionally there's else, uh, liquid water elsewhere. Mars, on the other hand, doesn't have has no water vapour in its atmosphere whatsoever, at least not detectable. It is there, but in minute quantities. Yeah. But this object, um, uh, K218b, uh, does have, because it's been detected. Now, um, in terms of its, you know, its uh, habitability, one of the problems with this place, apart from its its increased mass, which means that humans wouldn't really be able to survive there, uh, one of the, one of its perhaps even bigger problems is that the kind of star it orbits, which is called in the trade an M dwarf star, um, is known to have fairly violent outbursts, um, solar flares of a much more intense kind than we experience on the sun, and so um, that puts the planet in a, a radiation environment that is probably not particularly amenable to life. It may even be, you know, that it is just too highly, uh, that the radiation is just too high for there to be any living organisms on the planet. We, we simply don't know that. Uh, this kind of study is still in its infancy. And so um, as time goes on, we'll, we'll, with bigger instruments, the, the um, James Webb Space Telescope and things like that, we'll, we'll probably know more about that. So given its mass... Given its uh, parent star, given its temperature range, um, life would struggle there uh, as we know it. And uh, perhaps it's not a, a candidate to be an Earth 2. I mean, it's probably the best thing we've found so far in terms of a liquid water planet in a Goldilocks zone. But, um, yeah, it sounds like it's got a hostile host as a, as a, as a star, as a sun, and a few other things going against it. So we, um, we might have to keep looking, Fred. Indeed. Uh, so it, it's probably Earth 1.3 or something like that, <laughs> being Earth 2. Um, but yes, uh, we will have to keep looking. Uh, it probably won't be at this particular planet, though. I, I mean, it will be once we get the bigger telescopes. But uh, sending a spacecraft there is not really on the cards. I did a quick sum that says that with uh, 
you know, the fastest spacecraft we've ever launched, it would take one and a half million years to get there. And most of us lose interest in that kind of time scale. Yeah, and it'd be pretty boring. And I mean, you'd need to probably replace your pack of cards several times over while you're travelling. Uh, they wear out. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, again, the vastness of, of distance and time that, uh, that really cripples us in all our endeavours. We're, we, we're probably victims of our own success in many ways when it comes to astronomy because we're finding these things and going, isn't this exciting? Uh, except we can never go there and we yeah. never really will find out. So um, exactly. that's the hard but, part. But, uh, as I said, uh, with with the Kepler Space Telescope, sorry, I beg your pardon, the um, James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to Hubble, which has a six and a half metre diameter mirror, uh, and then with the coming generation of ground-based extremely large telescopes, um, we will find out a lot more about these objects. Yeah, that'll be the exciting part. We, um, yeah, Will we maybe be able to detect... Uh, maybe not detect life, but detect the uh, the elements that would almost confirm the probability. Yes. So, so what you're talking about are things we call biomarkers. That's and it. That's, that's um, you that's know too that's bigger word for me. <laughs> B I O. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, the in other words, the signature of of biological byproducts in the atmosphere of a of a of a planet and and. They include things like uh, oxygen out of balance with carbon dioxide and methane out of balance with other things. Uh, it's the kinds of, you know, the, the, the astrobiologists have got fairly well-defined signatures yeah. that living organisms might put into an atmosphere. Uh, it's not actually as neat and tidy a to- topic as, you know, you'd like it to be, but um, there is certainly a lot of work on this being done actually by one person who used to work at our observatory, uh, the Australian Astronomical Observatory, Vicky Meadows. She's, uh, I think she's at, um, I can't remember which institute she's at, but she's certainly been a, a very high profile figure in NASA's astrobiology uh, effort. So the Aussies are contributing to this as well. Very good. All right. Well, um, maybe not this planet, but uh, I'm thinking very soon we may well find uh, an Earth 2.0 that um, is in exactly the right place, is exactly the right size, next to the, exactly the same well, star as ours or one similar or just right. And, um, yeah, that, that could be a candidate for future um, investigation. Who knows? You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, to a discovery a little closer to home. This is a discovery that's uh, just been published uh, simply because where we were looking, we weren't able to see uh, until now, but uh, thanks to um, a, a rather beautifully named telescope, we, uh, which we've talked about before, we have now been able to have a look at uh, the, the central regions of our galaxy. And what they've discovered is that something cataclysmic happened there, uh, resulting in these, these uh, radio bubbles, I think they're calling them. Uh, this all sounds very, very weird, but also very exciting. Yeah, indeed it is. And um, it's the first, uh, I guess, the first really significant result from the complete Meerkat. And Meerkat is the name of this telescope. It's a radio telescope array in South Africa. Um, uh, it's we, we have talked about its name before because CAP is an abbreviation for the Karoo Array Telescope. Mm. Uh, and then when the South African government said, oh, you can have a few more dishes in that, um, they called it Moorcat in English, which in Afrikaans is Meerkat, which is a very nice little segue to those little mongoose-like things that you see in the, and the Karoo. As I speak, there are probably a dozen of them about two kilometres oh, yeah. from where and I the, sit. Because in the Western Plains Zoo. We have them at the zoo. I love yeah, them. They're right. so cute. Yeah, they're very cute. Um, just to, you know, to, to, to wave the flag a little bit as well, Meerkat, of course, is a kind of parallel to Australia's ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder, mm. which is out in Western Australia. Uh, ASCAP um, also has a large number of dishes. It's 36, but Meerkat is is bigger has in terms of its number of dishes, although the dishes themselves are smaller. Uh, it's got 64. Uh, and the difference between these two 
um, parts, which are still part of the preparations for the square kilometre array. Uh, the difference between them is that uh, the Australian dishes look essentially at low frequencies, radio frequencies. Uh, the meerkat dishes look at what you might call mid mid radio frequencies. Uh, so they're, they're kind of looking at the same universe, but in slightly different ways, and that makes them very complementary. So to the story. Yes. Um, these 64 antennas of the Meerkat array uh, have mapped the central region of our Milky Way galaxy. So what they've done is look towards the galactic centre, which is in the constellation of Sagittarius and, and regions around that, uh, the, the, the mapping has taken place. And they've been looking uh, specifically at these uh, these radio frequencies. Now, when you do that with a radio telescope, you see all these bright blobs and uh, Things like supernova remnants, which are the results of exploding stars, they show up very brightly. Uh, and there are also regions where new stars are being born, which show up very brightly in, in the radio. Um, that's what you find in the Milky Way. But what these investigators have found, and it's, I think this work is being led uh, by a team based both in Oxford and in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, what that this work has found is, is something that almost looks like an hourglass. Uh, these two bright radio lobes as above and below the plane of the Milky Way, centered really towards the galactic center. So if you imagine the Milky Way is this, you know, beautiful disk of stars and gas and dust and we're embedded in it, which is why we see the Milky Way. Um, the Milky Way galaxy also has this supermassive black hole at the center. I think it's... Uh, if I remember rightly, 4.1 million solar masses is about 4 million solar masses, um, which from time to time engages with its surroundings in a fairly explosive way. And that is what these astronomers think is the source of this kind of hourglass shape. So, you know, with one bubble above the plane of the Milky Way and the other bubble below it, perfectly symmetrical, the centre of the Milky Way galaxy right in the middle. And the suggestion is that something big has, has been swallowed up by the black hole at the centre of our galaxy, probably a few million years ago. And that's sort of basically sent out this gigantic cosmic burp, uh, which, um, it, you know, uh, has given rise to these radio signals as it runs into the what we call the interstellar medium. So there's a gas comes out at relativistic velocities, collides with the, the medium around it, the rarefied gas that populates our galaxy, uh, and, and basically... Um, you know, sculpts this cavity uh, that that is very bright. Well, it's not very bright, but it is bright in radio emission. Uh, saying very bright is actually a misleading thing to say, which is why I've just retracted it, because these guys had to work really hard to see this, mm. among all the other uh, brilliance of the radio sky near the galactic centre. In yeah, fact, the, the, uh, the, that's the problem with the galactic centre. It's, it's very difficult to observe because there's so much junk Lying yes, around in there. There is. Yeah, it's for the, it's you know the densest part of the Milky Way galaxy, and uh, it, it, exactly, this it's full of junk if we can put it that way. <laughs> it's just a, it's just a train wreck really when you look at it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, um, and actually, one of the authors, one of the lead authors uh, from Cape Town, uh, Professor Camillo, I think he's the way that his name is pronounced. He says um, finding this was like finding a tiny firefly in the presence of a bright torch. Mm. Um, and maybe I could just read um, a quote from him. The bubbles are, act are actually one big bubble structure stretched out with two lobes at the polar ends. They were created during the same event. From top to bottom, the structure is 1,400 light years. Um, uh, the bubbles are 25,000 light years away from the Earth, which is the distance to the, to the galactic centre. Now, uh, I... I... One of the th I, I did read the article, and I must confess I got a little bit sort of mesmerised by it and lost my way and found myself not understanding certain aspects of the discovery. But one of the things that I thought I read in the article uh, about it was that um, one day we might be able to observe this explosion. Does that mean the light hasn't reached us yet? Oh, that's interesting. Um, uh, um I haven't seen anything suggesting anything like that. No, in like fact, I, said, the, I got very confused. <laughs> yeah, the the light would have um, the light would have arrived at the you know uh, uh, basically twenty five thousand years yeah. after the 
event took place. Uh, but that was all several million years ago. Uh, it does tie in, though, Andrew, with um, some work that was done, I guess it's about three years ago, by a colleague of, of ours uh, here in Sydney. He's, uh, his name is Professor Joss Bland Hawthorne. He, he's at the University of Sydney, somebody I've known for a very long time. And he's, he's <laughs> one of the nearest things I know to a genius is Joss, because he's full of ideas. I, I found the piece that I was referring to. Uh, okay. In effect, this inflated energetic bubbles in the hot ionised gas near the galactic centre, energising it and generating radio waves, which could eventually de uh, be detected here on Earth. So, uh, which is what radio? Happened. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we, that's what we've seen. Yes, that's, that's right. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. there you go. Just going back to Joss, um, he and his colleagues uh, observed there's, there's a thing called a Magellanic Stream, which is a, a cloud of gas that links our galaxy with the two Magellanic Clouds, which are two dwarf galaxies that are effectively being gobbled up by our own galaxy. And there's this stream of radio emission uh, between the two, and it's more or less above the centre of our own galaxy. And uh, they, uh, Joss and his colleagues detected a brightness in the radio emission from the, the Magellanic Stream, which suggested that at some time in the past, it had been energised by what sounds like the same event. It may have been exactly the same event that we're talking about now. Okay. Uh, but this bubble of radiation blew out of the galactic centre and lit up the, the, the um, Magellanic Stream. So we can see its evidence there as well. Or it could be an entirely separate event. I'm just speculating here, but that's the, you know, that, that, that's the kind of thing that radio astronomers are looking at. As for what was the cause, as for what the black hole engulfed or whatever it is that happened... Um... We don't know. No, it's probably it, it could well be um, a, a sort of uh, almost like a feeding frenzy of the of the black hole, uh, because black holes are known to sort of flare up from time to time uh, as they consume the dust and gas around them. And maybe it's just that it, it was a particularly dense. Uh, blob of gas that found its way into the into the black hole and and produced maybe not just one but several powerful outbursts. Uh, we I mean we see evidence of this when we look into the distant universe because they are looking way back in the past when black holes were a lot more voracious than they are now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what you find are what we call quasars, and quasars are exactly this. They're black holes that have gone ballistic because they've got so much uh, stuff to consume and they're growing rapidly. They're also uh, generating intense magnetic fields which are shooting up jets, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the north and south from their poles. Um, and causing great brilliance at very great distances, which is what we now call quasars. So, uh, yeah, it's um, it, it's a phenomenon. Uh, the, the point I was going to make was that that doesn't happen in today's universe because there's not enough debris lying around for them to, to do that. So um, our own galaxy probably was a quasar, you know, four or five billion years ago, but it's settled down since then. But occasionally there might still be bursts of activity like the one perhaps a few million years ago that caused this phenomenon. Okay, very interesting. Uh, yeah, it hopefully is. Hopefully more to learn from that too. We will wait and see. Uh, you're listening to the Space Nuts podcast with Fred Watson and Andrew Dunkley. Okay, we checked all four systems and King with a go. Space Nuts. Uh, once again, want to send a, a big thank you to our patrons who are growing in numbers, and uh, that is fabulous. Uh, if you would like to become a patron of the Space Nuts podcast, you're welcome to do so. It's not mandatory. It is a voluntary thing. You can do it at patreon.com slash space nuts. Uh, there are different uh, tiers of support, and um, you can find out more about it by going to the site and reading up on it. And if it's not for you, that's fine. Uh, patreon.com slash space nuts if you would like to sign up as a patron and don't forget you can chat to other space nuts uh, people space nuts i think we call them uh, at the uh, space nuts facebook page so uh, just uh, do a search for the space nuts facebook group in uh, your facebook search engine and you should be able to find it and um, yeah put your name down to join up and uh, yeah that meet other people. They're talking to each other, Fred, fairly regularly now. The latest thing is comparing telescopes. 
which um, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> it's actually quite yep. fascinating. Yeah, uh, and when good they stuff. start getting into the techno speak, I sit there and go, uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really, really good. Uh, so lots to do online uh, while we're not around. And, um, yeah, uh, we do appreciate your ongoing support. Now, uh, some questions. Uh, we'll go to this uh, first one from uh, Michael Johnson. Uh, Michael Johnson? Yeah, Michael Johnson. Uh who has an interesting backstory, which I will mention. Uh, Dear Fred and Andrew, love your podcast. I always try to catch up with the latest episodes on my way back home from my harp gigs while on uh, country tour. Uh, On the subject of the Juno mission, I'm fascinated by the amount of radiation that Jupiter emitted, that Juno had to avoid uh, avoid its uh, orbits around the giant, uh, the gas giant. Without actually flying directly through the radiation belts about Jupiter, would it be possible for future probes to harness some of the radiation to power the probe's electronics rather than having to rely on solar panels. It seems logical that the biggest power source would be right there near Jupiter compared to the conversion of light from a distant sun. Uh, Looking forward to your reply, um, Michael Johnson. Now, Michael is the resident harpist and composer with the Royal Botanic Gardens in Sydney. That is awesome. Um, we're getting some classy people listen to us, Fred. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit outranked now, but uh, <laughs> it's good to have you along, Michael. Thanks for the question, and it's a good question. That is, you know, obviously there's there's power there. Why do we need to sort of still rely on the sun when we're right next to something much more powerful at that position in space? Well, that's yes, that's a really it's a good question. And um, greetings, Michael. And um, you probably know some of the people I know in the world of harp, <laughs> classical harpism, uh, like Alice Giles uh, and, uh, and other harpists um, that I've had the pleasure of working with from time to time. He does throw uh, in a PS. Enjoyed your blues song on your website. So that's right. You're never going to escape that. So that's all right. That's fair enough. If I'm going to be known for something, it might as well be the blues. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But look, look, what a great question. And uh, in fact, Juno is interesting because that was the first mission to Jupiter that did use solar panels rather than uh, an RTG, a radio isotope thermoelectric generator. Uh, And uh, perhaps uh, just to illustrate that, the pioneers and the voyagers and the, and the, the Galileos uh, all used RTGs. But Juno uh, boasts these, what I think are the largest solar panels ever launched into space. So I might not quite be right because the International Space Station has got colossal ones. But anyway, uh, they are big. Uh, Why didn't they use an RTG with Juno? Uh, Two things. One, solar panel technology had come of age so that the the 4% uh, of what we receive, which is what Jupiter receives in terms of sunlight, uh, was enough to power the spacecraft. Uh, And the other thing is that the plutonium isotope that's used in the radio isotope uh, thermoelectric generators is getting more and more rare. It's actually uh, more expensive and it turned out that it was cheaper to build the solar panels, uh, which is in many ways the bottom line. So that might go to the heart of the answer to this question, which is, uh, I mean, we see those radiation belts as very, very dangerous. They uh, have the tendency to fry electronics rather than make themselves useful. Uh, and that's why exactly why, as, um, as Michael has said, that the orbit of Juno is highly elongated. It's, uh, it, it's so that the spacecraft spends most of its time on the outside of these radio, radiation belts uh, and uh, ducks underneath them for a short time near the surface of the, of the planet or the, near the top of the cloud layers of the planet uh, and then ducks out again to avoid its electronics being fried. I'm not sufficiently uh, well versed as an an electrical engineer to know whether you could ever harness that uh, that that you know that energy that's in the radiation belts Mm. but I think the bottom line is likely to be that uh, such technology if it exists might very well be more expensive to implement than simply good old solar panels, which are now at a, at a level of sensitivity that actually make them a, a viable alternative. Yeah, cheap as chips these days. And, of course, with the, the battery systems that are available, you can just keep recharging them. And, hmm. um, yeah, it's and, and, and relatively lightweight too, I suppose, in the scheme of things. But, um, 
uh, very very efficient. Uh, and and the new the new technology in solar panels is they're, they're incredibly efficient um, when you get to the high end uh, versions of the product. So uh, it does make sense, um, and then they're easier to um, to point in the right direction too, I suppose. So there's all sorts of benefits to solar panels. Um, but yeah, maybe one day uh, we will need to look at other options, or um, maybe find a cheaper alternative that does uh, does the job. Uh, so um, uh, it's a question worth asking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michael, thank you for that, and uh, I, I do want to um, see if I can find you online and listen to you on the harp. I just think it's an amazing instrument. I am always mesmerised by it when um, people play it so beautifully. Now, let's uh, move on to a question from Lloyd Galbraith in Cairns, North Queensland. Hi, Lloyd. Uh, He says, back in the 70s, when he was about 10, he was walking through the bush just south of Sydney and kicked a rock. The dam near broke his toe. Uh, He said he picked it up and even then uh, could tell it was no ordinary rock. It seemed twice as heavy as uh, it should have been. So he carried it home and uh, he's had it ever since. Uh, now, he says, I've always thought it could have been a meteorite or something like that. It is black. Uh, it never rusts. It gets a black powder carbon-like um, surface, uh, heavy as hell, but uh, does not attract a magnet. Uh, one of my kids dropped it some years ago and broke it into bits. And inside, it is still black through, even though it had uh, silver-type flakes inside. Uh, Now, some 47 years later, I'd really like to know what it is. I've done some uh, home-based tests, and to be honest, nothing I've done is really confirmed or not, if it is or isn't a meteorite. Um, So what do you think? What's he found? I don't know. He's found Um, coal. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think it's a meteorite, though, um, because uh, meteorites generally well the, certainly the metal ones the the um, iron and nickel meteorites um they are very obviously metallic and as as uh, uh lloyd kind of hints uh they do have magnetism they, you know the the uh, you can stick a magnet on one and it'll stick very hard because the it's the iron it's soft iron and uh and essentially uh, a bit of nickel in there that um is what makes the metal meteorites uh, and when you drop them they tend not to break they usually break the floor instead because they're very solid and quite dense being lumps of iron they also um have a a bit of a a, a sort of giveaway in the sense that their surfaces are usually pitted because as they fly through the atmosphere, the surface gets very hot and it ablates, it burns away and it leaves little pits behind, uh, which, uh, you know, they've got, kind of got smoothed edges. But once you've seen one, you kind of recognise this pitted appearance. Um, the stony meteorites are normally much lighter in weight and much lighter in colour. They're you know, they're sort of beige rather than uh, this metallic colour that an iron meteorite would be. But they too have the have the pitted surface on the outside. Um, this sounds like something different because it, it, it's clearly got a surface that, that powderises. You know, it gets a black powder carbon like um, uh, surface on the on the sorry, it gets a black powder carbon like on the surface uh heavy as hell which you know that suggests a metal meteorite but uh i i suspect it's something else i wonder whether it uh it, it could be um you know a a, a a phenomenon, a, a, a different pro, a product of different geological uh geological phenomena <clears throat> um possibly even volcanic mm. Uh, in origin. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that Lloyd's asking where to send it um, <laughs> while he's still alive. To that, but, uh... and, I know, and I know that feeling myself. Oh, I must do something about this while I'm still alive. Uh, uh, and, well, you know, it's a bit of a problem in Cairns. Um, the, the kinds of places who would certainly be able to give you uh, information about whether it was meteoritic would be the Australian Museum in Sydney, uh, or the University of Western Australia in Perth, because they've got probably the best collection of meteorites in the country. Uh, so they've got every kind of variety of meteorites and would certainly know uh, about its origin. Um, but that might not be very convenient. Uh, I, you might be able to uh, send a piece of it. 
Well, but yes, that's right. Uh, since it's the kids possible. broke it. Since, since the kids broke it into bits. <laughs> that, that in itself makes me wonder whether it is meteoritic, because meteorites are usually much more firmly stuck together than that. And as I said, if it's an iron one, you drop it and it breaks the concrete or the floor that you've landed on. I'm sticking with the coal theory in that case. You think it's a bit of coal? Well, be coal. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Although coal tends to be a bit brittle too, so... It does, yeah. And it's usually, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I used to deal with coal a lot because it's in, not heavy. When I was a kid, we had coal everywhere. It's not that heavy and it's it's clearly, you know, it's got a, a obviously shiny surface that it actually looks like petrified wood almost, mm. but, which is effectively what it is. Yeah, interesting. Right. Sorry, Lloyd, I can't be any more specific than that. I do apologise. But the probability is not a meteorite. I, I will guess, yes. Yeah. All right. Lloyd, thank you, and I hope you're enjoying sunny Cairns up there in the tropics, Cyclone Central. Sorry about that. Uh, now let's move on to our final question, and uh, this one came in um, only like uh, yesterday or today, but uh, I, I'm throwing it in there because um, uh, for two reasons. It, it, it's a, it's a, a question that obviously um, came to mind in that it seems so simple and he's a little embarrassed asking the question, but I think it's a great question because it gets us back to basics. Um, He says, hey, Fred and Andrew, this seems like such a simple question and maybe it is, but why do planets spin in the first place? I understand that gravity attracts the planets around the sun, uh, but what caused the planets themselves to start spinning? I know stars and planets are formed in clouds of gas and dust, which are constantly in motion, but I imagine Fred can probably explain it in a better way. Been a keen listener for two months now and listened to 165 episodes. Gee, Miles, get a job. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Uh, thank you so much for making my job so much better. He listens while he's at work. So, so, so he has got a job. He has got a job. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Miles. It is a good question, and it and it's it kind of goes to the heart of you know what we know about the solar system. And actually, Miles has uh, already put his finger on it in in the sentence that says, I know stars and planets are formed in clouds of gas and dust, which are constantly in motion. And that's exactly what's happening. So you've got you've got a a cloud of dust and gas and it's kind of swirling around. Um, What tends to happen is that you find little eddies of 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 almost like air currents within the cloud of gas. Uh, And these are going in all sorts of random directions and they're all over the gas cloud. But over time, what's happening to this gas cloud is that it's, and and dust as well, is that it's collapsing under its own gravity. So it starts to collapse. And as as it does, you get, um, you know, of all these, this mishmash of, of rotating eddies within the gas cloud, there emerges from that a preferred direction of rotation. And so the gas and dust cloud itself begins to rotate. And that is what we see. It's the fossil of that rotation that we see in the sun, the planets, uh, the way they spin, the direction in which they spin. They, uh, virtually all of them uh, spin anti-clockwise as seen from the sol- above the solar system's north pole. That includes the sun as well. Um, and that's the direction in which the planets revolve around the sun. So that uh, it all comes from the rotation of the dust and gas cloud itself. So as that collapse took place, uh, the central regions got very dense and it eventually turned into the sun, the, a, a baby star, because the uh, <clears throat> the density, the, the compression was sufficient to raise the temperature so that you got nuclear fusion taking place. And the, and the dust and other gaseous debris around it flattened down into a disk, which once again carried the rotation of the gas cloud with it. Uh, and it's within that disk that the planets formed. So once again, this, this direction of spin is is a fossilised version of the, the way the original gas cloud was spinning. Okay, fascinating. See, I, I would have thought that it was just a, a symptom of the Big Bang and we're just spinning because of the outward <laughs> blast that continues to this day. But um, obviously, yeah, there's a lot more at play. And there are some things in the uh, in the universe that don't spin the way everything else does, but that's probably because of an intervention, and I guess yes. Neptune would be an example of that. It's, it? it's uh, Uranus, Uranus, that's Uranus. Right. Yeah. On, on it, which is kind of on its side. Um, in fact, the, it's 
its pole, its north pole is slightly below its, um, you know, the plane of its orbit. So it, you could say it's upside down because yeah. it's, it's nearer to being upside down than right way up. Exactly. <clears throat> All yeah. right, Miles, thanks for the question. That no, was a really good one. appreciate you um, putting it forward. And we appreciate everybody who puts uh, their thoughts forward um, for the Space Nuts podcast, whether that's between each other now on the Facebook podcast group or uh, or to us directly through our website, bites, B-I-T-E-Z dot com slash Space Nuts. That's the best place to post your questions, but people uh, have been posting them on Facebook as well. That's fine. Uh, but keep them coming. We'll try and get to as many as we can. We uh, seem to be bumping off fewer than arrive, but um, sometimes people ask questions we've already answered and we'll let you know if that's the case. And that's about it for another week, Fred. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure, Andrew. And um, I hope we'll talk again in a week's time. I hope so too. Catch you soon. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And thank you again for supporting our podcast. We'll talk to you again real soon on Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.